da dit, da da da, da da da, da did it. Da da da, 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 which is quite enough of that, and more about it later on. But uh, meanwhile, what about this? A new sort of curtain material. It's thin. It's light. Looks very nice, and it has a surprising property. It is a very good insulator. Now, this big light behind the curtain is the equivalent of two bars on an electric fire, and when I put my hand there, I can scarcely feel it. The secret is a thin metal coating on the material, which reflects the heat while still letting as much as 94% of the light get through. It's the idea of a Dutch shipbuilding firm. The cloth is produced in a small town near the Dutch-German border. It's taken ten years to get to this stage, where the material behaves like conventional cloth, but has many other advantages. The problem was to combine man-made fibres with a thin coating of pure metal. In the early days, the fibres and the metal didn't always stick together properly. The main difficulty was getting a uniform thickness of metal on the cloth, which was permanent and wouldn't flake off. Each batch is checked under the microscope to make sure that everything is working successfully. A single strand of nylon teased from a sample of cloth. The dark areas are covered with metal which glints in the light. On a small scale, the process is remarkably simple. Cloth, which has been chemically pre-treated so that the metal will adhere to it, is stretched tightly over a frame. Only one side is exposed to the vaporized metal which will coat it. The whole process takes place in a vacuum chamber. In this experimental machine, small aluminium rods, about the size of one-inch nails, are placed inside the coils of heating elements. Later in the process, these rods will vaporize. The cloth has to be kept moving all the time to make sure that the aluminium is distributed evenly. The next step is to pump the air from the vacuum chamber. Then the current is switched on to make the coil hot enough to melt the aluminium. The temperature is brought up slowly because the heated element could easily burn out. The elements have to reach 1400 degrees centigrade before the aluminium starts to melt and then in the vacuum it vaporizes. When all the metal has boiled away and the heating coils cooled, air is let into the chamber and the cloth with its fine deposit of aluminium is ready. Each thread is covered on one side only with a film of metal one two hundred and eighty thousandth of an inch thick. When the theory had been worked out in the laboratory, the engineers built a first continuous system capable of handling a large moving belt of cloth. At the same time, they had to invent a way of feeding the correct amount of aluminium into special vaporizing troughs. Once again, there were problems due mainly to the size of the machine. But last year, they solved the last of them, and now this machine can cope with 700 yards of cloth at a time. The speed of the material passing through the machine decides how much aluminium will be deposited on it. Just as in the laboratory model, the air is let in when the process is finished, the heaters are cooled down, and the completed cloth is unloaded. Frequent spot checks under a microscope are made to ensure that the metal and the material are sticking together properly. At the same time, it's possible to keep an eye on the purity of the aluminium used. And this is the latest model, the largest vacuum depositor in the world. It was finished only a month ago, and it can handle more than one mile of material at a time. This machine is fully automatic and it has a built-in computer to operate it. Once set, the machine brings the cloth and metal vapor together to produce a completely uniform result without the need any longer for microscopic checks. And when it's ready for the next load of cloth, it simply opens its doors as a signal. One university in Holland found that when material from this machine was used for curtains, its remarkable insulation properties cut the heating bill of a three-bedroomed house by 15%. And other tests have shown that it needs to be washed only once a year because it's dirt repellent. And even then, it dries in minutes. 
da da dit, da 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 did it, etc., etc. What we were trying to say at the beginning of the program was good evening in Morse and get this machine to print it out. Well, as you will have gathered, our Morse uh, is a bit rusty, but now watch this because Chris Nababi here, who helped design and build this machine, is a bit of an expert. First of all, he gives the machine the command to switch on. There you are, dictated in Morse and printed out in plain language. In fact, this is a small computer, and as you heard, it works on a slightly modified Morse code. Now, this board here is the analog part of the computer. It separates out the dars from the dits, measures the time interval between them in order to determine the end of each letter group. And this, it converts into an electronic signal. The signal is amplified here on this board and then passed simultaneously to these four boards here. There are 64 variations of dots and dashes that are being used in this particular code and on these panels there are 64 electronic gates. Each gate will open when it's given the right signal and then this allows an electronic pulse through to the appropriate part of the typewriter, be that a space key or a letter or whatever. Now, I'll try it on this microphone myself. He switched it on. A in Morse is didar, as you know. Dida, dida, dida. Very successful. Now, you may think that that is um, a very slow way to type a letter, but consider the case of the totally paralyzed person, for instance, who hereby could take care of letter writing himself. The sensitivity of these controls here is perhaps deceptively simple. Once the machine is set up, it needs no further adjustment, and as you could see, it can cope with both Mr. Namavi's voice and my own. What's more, you don't have just to use it as a typewriter. In fact, it can be made to do anything which is normally done with a switch. You could switch on a light, switch on an electric fan, change uh, channels on a television set, if you like. And we have set it up here to operate a telephone. Now, here we have uh, a normal uh, telephone in the television center system. Here we have a loudspeaker which bypasses the normal handset. I'm going to ask Mr. Nabavi First of all, to give the machine the order to get the typewriter out and the telephone in circuit. There we go. Now, will you dial extension 4200? <laughs> Hello? Who that? Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> well, you got the right number because you, James, you got James Burke. Ring him off. Ring did him. it, uh, did it. This is, in fact, the first prototype, and it uh, goes on show for the first time next week at the physics exhibition at Alexandra Palace. The decision whether or not to market it has not yet been made, but if it is made, the makers reckon that the electronic side of it will cost about 200 pounds. But the important thing about it is that this is one more step towards controlling machinery simply by talking to it. Thank you very much, Mr. Nabari. The moon's lifeless surface is pitted with thousands of craters, some up to 100 miles across, others just a few feet. If scientists knew what the moon was made of, they could find out how these craters were formed. Were they created by molten rock from huge volcanic eruptions on the moon's surface millions of years ago? Or were they caused by the explosive impact of meteorites from deep space? When the American astronauts step out from Apollo 11 onto the surface of the moon, one of the things they have to do is to collect 40 kilograms of lunar rock samples. Packed in plastic bags, these will be stored in a special aluminum container back on the lunar module. On Earth, at uh, the Houston Receiving Laboratory, they'll be split up into samples not much bigger than this, which will go to 135 laboratories around the world, 16 of which will be in Britain. The job then will be to find out what these samples are 
and how they got there. At this laboratory in Cambridge, very thin transparent sections will be cut from the moon rock and examined through a polarising microscope, which should reveal the different minerals in the sample. It's in a laboratory like this that, for the first time, man will learn what the moon is made of. To find out what's in the minerals of the moon rock, a tiny portion will be bombarded with X-rays in this special microscope. This will not only show them, but measure them too. There's another experiment to find out how the atoms are arranged in the minerals. During it, a tiny crystal of moon rock will be bombarded for days on end with more X-rays. Different atoms scatter the X-rays in different ways, and as they do, so they register on a photographic plate. The pinpoints indicate the atomic structure of the moon mineral and will probably show how it was originally formed. These tests should show pretty conclusively what minerals there are in the lunar rock and what it's made of. But recently, the whole question of whether there's ever been life on the moon has been hotting up. One American scientist maintains that the moon is a kind of burnt-out Earth and that large parts of it should be discovered to contain masses of dead organisms. Others say this is absolute rubbish and that if there ever was life on the moon, it never had a chance to develop into anything remotely recognisable. These lunar samples are going to be among the most highly investigated bits of rock in the Earth's history. When the people from the 135 laboratories have finished bombarding their samples with X-rays, ultraviolet rays, accelerated protons and the like, all the data will be collected and compared by NASA in America. 134 of these 135 laboratories are going to have to wait for their samples until Apollo 11 gets back. But for one group in London, that's just not going to be good enough. At this laboratory, a piece of rock is heated in a furnace to over 1,200 degrees centigrade until it melts. This is about the temperature that existed beneath the moon's surface millions of years ago. In this experiment, the liquid rock is placed in a tank which is hermetically sealed. Then all the air is drawn out to create a total vacuum. As the air thins and finally vanishes, the gases in the rock expand and bubble out. The idea is to duplicate probable volcanic eruptions on the moon's surface which happened over a period of time several million years ago. But here it takes less than a minute. Throughout its history, the moon's surface must have been weathered by the solar winds and small meteorites shattering its surface, exposing the mass of gas bubbles in the rock. This rock is over ten times more porous than anything created naturally on Earth. The researchers here confidently expect the sample they eventually get from the moon to be something like this. This bit of stuff costs about a fiver to make in the laboratory, but when you consider that if the London group are right, they may help to provide the answer to a problem that the Americans have already spent hundreds of millions of pounds just to study, then it's a fiver pretty well spent. <laughs>